Ich muss doch nicht wieder Bericht auslösen. So. So is my screen visible to everybody? Looks good. So uh, last week, uh, and again, if there's any question coming up, uh, then just uh, unmute your microphone and feel free to ask and I'm happy to answer and address any questions as they come along. So last week we started out with uh, control Japono functions and as a uh, introduction to that, I started to, to show you something about Japon of stability theory. You might remember the nice video with the coins and the fun that, I show, that I've shown you. And this was probably some inspiration for, for Alexander Japono for his stability theory. So mainly this is a kind of energy method if you want so. So we start out with a differential equation, which is an autonomous one. So there is no input yet, no control input yet. We assume that there's an equilibrium point in the origin. And just by the way, and we're going to see this today, nonlinear systems might have various, uh, many uh, uh, equilibrium points. Some of them are stable, some of them are unstable. And um, we assume that there is a function, which we call the Japondo function. And of course, it's V of X. We assume that it's zero in the origin. We assume that it's greater than zero everywhere else. You might remember this basic idea in mechanics to choose the, the total energy of the system as a Japano function. And then there is some neighborhood U2, which we uh, name here. And within that neighborhood, we assume that uh, the, the time derivative of the Japano function. So if we move along that any trajectory of the system, the Japono function is uh, either strictly decreasing, which would, which would be that one, or it's decreasing. And if you remember, this, this equal sign refers to situations where the, the, Japono, the, 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 the time derivative of the Japono function is zero in, in singular points, but not along trajectories of the system. Okay? So if it's always less than zero, we call the system asymptotically stable, otherwise it's just stable. So, and we assume that uh, when we dot this is equal to zero, this must, this must only happen uh, in singular points, but not on, on certain, not on trajectories of the system, if you remember. Okay. Also, we mentioned that uh, the Japono function it should not always be, it, it should not only be greater than zero, but it should be radially unbounded. And this is termed here, radial, radial unboundedness means that if, uh, the, the argument of the function, which is x, which is a vector, uh, goes to infinity in terms of its absolute value, of course, then so does the, the Japona function v of x. And we are going to see an, an example later today that illustrates why this is very important. So there are, of course, a variety of possible Japona functions and, and, and system trajectories. There are just two example given here, examples given here which you might remember from, from last week. And then the nice thing about the Japan of stability theory is uh, that you don't have to solve the differential equation. If the differential equation is given, in order to examine the system for stability, you don't have to solve it, but you just take the time derivative of the Japan of function, which is given here. It's obviously, it's the gradient, V of x uh, times x dot. So you might even express this as a lead derivative. So it's uh, the, lever, the lead derivative of uh, uh, V along uh, F. So if you insert F and then if you check whether this is negative, uh, you're able to check for stability without solving the differential equation. And this is the reason why it's called the direct method of Japono. Okay. So there is a more concise uh, reformulation which has been carried out by Barbashin and Rasovsky, which you can see here. And again, I'm not going to read everything uh, for you. Very important is that uh, if there is any situation in the, in the state space, so if you find any uh, locations in the state space where we dot is equal to zero, uh, they, might, they must not contain a whole trajectory x of t. So there's one counter example of that, which is this one here. So obviously the, the Lyapunov function is some kind of uh, rotational uh, par paraboloid, for example. And then there, that, that could be the, the system trajectory of, a, of, a, of an undamped system. For example, if you model uh, our spring mass system, so that there is a mass, there's a spring constant. And if we model the motion of the system, you know if it's undamped, 
it's going to oscillate forever. So a typical system trajectory in the state space is going to look like that. And in particular, it's closed. So it never goes, it, it never spirals to the origin. So if there would be some damping here, it would probably spiral to the origin. In this case, it isn't. And this system has this special uh, property that the, the, this particular trajectory always remains on the level curve of the Lyapunov function. So it never decreases. So if you imagine that the Lyapunov function if you imagine that this is x, so our x1 is equal to x, x2 might be x dot. So uh, the Lyapunov function, if it, if it looks like that, it could be represented as the total energy of the system. So the energy of that system would be one half times the spring constant times x squared plus one half times the mass times x dot squared. So you can see. Uh, you can see directly that this refers to this kind of Lyapunov function. Obviously, this energy is contained. It's a conservative system. So the uh, trajectory is on the level curve of the Lyapunov function. Okay. So that was the, 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 the theory. There was a nice illustration example, which was this one. You remember it probably. This is a system of differential equations. Two, two coupled differential equations. So they're coupled, which means x dot is influenced by x2, and so is x2 by x1. Obviously, there are equilibrium points. One is in the origin. So if both x1 and x2 are zero, then it's uh, an equilibrium point. And also, if x1 and x2 are both equal one, it's also an equilibrium point. We chose this Lyapunov function. Again, it's the, the, um, the one with the radial with the circles as contour lines. And then we made the examination whether it's less than zero or not. And we found out, we found out that we thought it's always less than zero if both x1 is less than one and x2 is less than one. Let me illustrate this briefly. This was the, the figure. This is the figure that you also have in your, in your lecture notes. And obviously can, you can see that all those trajectories drive into the origin and Obviously, also there's a second uh, equilibrium point, which is this one, which is actually not stable in the sense of Lyapunov. And uh, you can see that uh, I just uh, I just managed to to draw this. If you want to ultimate circle, so you can see within that circle for all the trajectories, obviously that start within that circle, they will definitely strive to the origin. Even this one, you can see here. If I just try to magnify this. Uh, it takes probably a little more time to go to the origin than it, uh, than it does here, but eventually even also this trajectory is going to the origin. You can see that this point, this second equilibrium point, is just not stable anymore. So if you just move in a little bit, like a little bit into that direction, you will get a, a trajectory that, uh, that runs into the origin. If you only move a little bit into that direction, the, the resulting uh, solution is going to infinity. So you can see, obviously, from inspection, this is a very simple example. You can see from inspection that there's a kind of uh, separation line, which I'm going to draw here. And uh, in this region, we are unstable. And I probably should, should choose a different color. And in this region, obviously, we are stable, OK? So what, uh, what we can conclude from this is, even though we have uh, a circle, as a, yeah, a circle is up on the function contour lines, it might be that there are some, uh, some, some points in the state space, like this one, that do not satisfy the Lyapunov, func uh, the Lyapunov condition. Obviously, we, we had this uh, condition that both x1 and x2 should be less than one. And, and regardless of this, if we start, if you look at this point, it, uh, it violates this condition here. But nevertheless, it goes into the origin. So you can see the Lyapunov functions and the Lyapunov uh, stability is normally very restrictive, uh, very conservative. And uh, in this case, we have this uh, separation line here. This is normally called a separatrix. So if there is a separation line in the state space that separates the unstable region from the stable region, and it's called a separatrix. And we are going to return to this later on. Okay. So I've also mentioned last week that uh, the problem with Lyapunov stability is normally in finding a certain Lyapunov function. If there is a very complicated system, this one is not complicated, obviously, 
But if we have a very sophisticated system, we normally have the problem of finding a Lyapunov function. And of course, there are some, there are some recipes. And one is the so-called quadratic Lyapunov function, which looks like this. So we have a, ma a matrix R that must be positive definite. And uh, if you find one for a certain system, then we are happy and we're able to prove Lyapunov stability. So there's one very simple example, which is we consider a linear system. And obviously for linear systems, we don't need Lyapunov stability theory because we know how to prove stability. It's only in the eigenvalues of A. So if, if the matrix A is a Hurwitz matrix, okay. You should already know this name, Hurwitz matrix then this system is stable. So essentially we wouldn't need nonlinear stability theory for that, but it's a good example to show you what is going on. So if you take the Lyapunov function like this, if we take its time derivative, we find out that it looks like this. So this, so V dot is equal to X transpose time, times a certain matrix times X. So if that should be less than zero, so if we want uh, the Lyapunov function to be negative definite, then obviously this, this matrix, which is denoted as minus Q, must be a negative definite, or in other words, Q has to be positive definite, which takes us to this equation, which is called the Lyapunov equation. And I've mentioned uh, this is actually a famous equation, which is also uh, solvable. So you might even look this up in MATLAB. If you are already working with MATLAB, you can try this, the, the command Lyapunov. And obviously there are many resources in the internet where you can find it. So again, my recommendation would be today, uh, whenever you come across a certain equation or something that you're not familiar with, it's always a good idea to also look it up in, in the internet because uh, for almost everything, there's an answer in the internet and you might, you should be able to look it up and then also uh, help yourself with this. Okay. So, one important thing, and I've just mentioned this here in red, uh, this is a, an example, a very simple example for a linear system. It doesn't mean, though, that such a Lyapunov function, a quadratic Lyapunov function, is restricted to the use with linear system. So, for every dynamic system, be it a linear one or a nonlinear one, if you find your, if, you're, if you're lucky enough to find a quadratic Lyapunov function, that satisfies V dot is less than zero, then it's good enough for stability uh, proofs. And this is also how Lyapunov functions are used in practice. Oftentimes, you have a nonlinear system, then you linearize it, you, com you determine some kind of control law, and then based on the linearized system where you get a matrix A, you're probably trying to, to find a quadratic Lyapunov function, then you're trying to use that Lyapunov function also on the nonlinear system. This is a typical way how it is done, okay? So this is the corresponding theorem, of course. And everything that I've said, of course, is also found in, 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 the, in the course book. Obviously, uh, applying Lyapunov stability theory uh, for a linear system has no significance. It's just here for educational purposes and just keep in mind that whenever you find something like this and it works also for the nonlinear system, it's also good enough. So this takes me to the next point and this is very important for practical uh, applicability and this is the so-called domain of attraction, okay? You've, ju you've just seen in the previous example, let me go back to this. We have a stable uh, equilibrium point here the same one and the same system has a second equilibrium point, which is actually, actually really close by. And ob obviously this is not stable. So if you just uh, disturb this equilibrium by a little to the right, you will run into infinity. If you turn it to a little to the lower left, if you want, so it's stable. So in general terms, once we find out, once we found out that this equilibrium point is a stable one in the sense of Lyapunov, just remember we found this Lyapunov function, we made all these uh, computations, we found it's fine. The question really is how far outward might we want to, to venture or how, how far outward could we look until we actually run into problems. And obviously this is not symmetric. So if we, if we start from this equilibrium point and if we move into that direction and start out here, we see that this is rather generous. So in this case, we are probably moving that way and eventually the system is going to the origin. If we go into the same, by the same distance, but into a different direction, namely direction, namely here, then we get a problem. So the question really is, um, in our state space, what is the domain of attraction? So where, where, 
wrap out in the space in the state space might we want to start with our nonlinear dynamic systems system and uh, go into the origin and is there kind is there some kind of boundary which are called the separatrix uh, where there's a difference between stability a stable region and an unstable region this is covered in the next section which we found here and uh, I already mentioned this this term separatrix and I also mentioned in words though that just proving the stability of an equilibrium point in, in a practical system is generally not sufficient. We also have to give some uh, clues on how big is this region of attraction. Is there any region in the state space where we are not stable, where the, where the system trajectories are not going to run into the origin? And the answer to this is the so-called, uh, the term positively invariant set. What is this? A positively invariant set, and this, this is highlighted here, this is the same example as before, um, would be like this. Uh, if we start anywhere in this uh, purple shaded region, for example, like here, then the, the, uh, the, the solution of the differential equation, which is called the trajectory of the system, would in this case definitely run into the origin. Same is true for this starting point. If we started here, it would definitely also be true. If we started right here, so you see this is a, a starting point which is very close to the separatrix. So we move along the separatrix, very close along the separatrix for quite an amount of time. Only very late in time, we are going to take a turn and go into the origin. So a positively invariant set is one where we start out with initial conditions, so let's call this x0, and everywhere, and uh, if we take uh, x0 anywhere in this positively invariant set, uh, our trajectories that we are going to get will, will are going to remain within that set, are never going to leave it, so if, it, if we start it out here, it's not going to do something like this, for example, so this is not true, it's going to monotonically stay within that set, and uh, go into the origin. This is what we call a positively invariant set in this context. And uh, why do we know, why do we need this? Because if we start like if we start in any point in the state space, we want to make sure that v dot v dot is always less than zero. This is one thing. And also we want to make sure that we are never going to leave the set again. So it might be the case theoretically, though, and not in this example. Let me just. Uh, sketch this that we start here so v dot is less than zero it's less than zero it's less than zero and then we make a turn into this region and then v dot is not less than zero anymore so this must not happen and if we can guarantee this then uh, we get something which we call a positively invariant set so you see this is easier explained than done because proving that such a thing is not going to happen is definitely in practice it's not easy which I have to say, okay? And this is the, uh, the, mathical, the mathematical formulation of the, the positively invariant set. Mm -hmm. and so if you have this, then we are happy. And then of course, if V dot is less than zero within that set, then we can make sure that only once we have entered that set, uh, the system is going into the origin and we, we are going to be happy. So this is very important for practical considerations. Any practical system is normally limited so if there's a stable uh, uh, equilibrium point in any practical system, not be able to reach it from anywhere in the state space. Okay, this is very, very important. Theoretical systems or mathematical systems uh, might not have these properties, but any practical system will, in, in some region of the state space, you're going to experience some problems. Okay. So there's one example, one counter example, which should serve as a warning for you, okay? So we we'll use a Lyapunov function, which is this one here. And this looks nice in, at first glance, so it's, it's always greater than zero. But if you take a closer look at this, you will see, first of all, if x2 goes to infinity, then so does the Lyapunov function, because there's two times x2 squared. However, on the contrary, if x1 goes to infinity, then this Lyapunov function, let's assume that x2 is zero, and if x1 goes to infinity, then this Lyapunov function does not go to infinity, but it converges to one, as you can see here, obviously. Which means the function is not radially unbounded, uh, so this uh, condition does not hold, and I'm going to show you by this example what are the consequences, okay? 
As a first consequence, we see that the level curves of the Lyapunov function are not always closed. So in all the pre preceding examples, as you can see here, we had level curves of the Lyapunov function, which are always closed. In this example, this is no longer the case. So you can see this here. There is some, there's one, there is a region in the state space where the level curves of the Lyapunov function, they look nice. There's some kind of ratio, obviously, but then they, they just uh, stretch out to infinity as x1 goes to infinity or to minus infinity. There is another region in the state space, which is this one, where we have closed sections of the Lyapunov uh, function, the closed sections of the, of the level curves, as you can see here. And as you can see by this example, this will have a certain consequence for stability. So there's one, what you can see here in blue is one possible trajectory of a system. It's just a fantasy system if you want so. But obviously already from, from inspection, you can see that this is not a stable system. So this is our initial condition. And the trajectory of the system goes to infinity. Obviously by inspection, we see it's not stable. It does not converge to any uh, equilibrium point. But the Lyapunov function doesn't show this because the Lyapunov function more or less has the same shape as you can see here. So it's not going to show up that the system is unstable. And I'm going to show you the mathematical reason for this. First of all, of course, G is not a positively invariant set. And now we construct a fantasy mathematical system if we want so, which is this one. And if we take this, and if we compute the, the time derivative of this Lyapunov function, and insert uh, this one here, then we get this as a result for the uh, change of the Lyapunov function over time. So you can see it contains squares of x1, squares of x2. So this is obviously, there's a minus here. So obviously it's always less than zero regardless of our trajectory. And if you look at this a little bit more closely, you can see, first of all, x2, that seems rather harmless. x2 is actually decreasing. So uh, regardless of the initial condition, x2 is going to decrease exponentially. For x1, the situation is a little bit more involved, as you can see here. You can see that uh, depending actually on the sign of x2, x1 might decrease or it might increase. So this, this is very uh, similar to a, to a system that, that we already considered last week. So it really depends on the state space, on the location of the state space, whether our trajectories are going to converge or diverge, obviously. Okay, so and you can already see this here in this uh, second figure here. Uh, de depending on the actual value of uh, x2, our system might either uh, go to infinity or it might uh, converge uh, into the origin, which uh, obviously uh, depends on, on uh, next two and on the initial condition. So for example, if we have very small values of x1, then uh, regardless of x2, our system converges uh, to the origin. And uh, for bigger initial values, like for example, this one, we get a problem. So we're going to, to examine this uh, in the sequel. But right now you can see uh, the funny thing is, this Lyapunov function looks pretty nice. So it's, it's time derivative is less than zero. So we might conclude, okay, this is true for each, for all values, for all combinations of x1 and x2. So this is a stable system. It's very nice. It's not. And the reason for this is because our Lyapunov function was not properly chosen. It's not radially unbounded. unbounded. This is the reason. So we might now want to examine it a little bit more closely because as I said before, there are some regions in the state space where this Lyapunov function might still serve as a stability uh, criterion and we're going to make some examinations of this in the, in the sequel. First of all, for these nasty differential equations, there is an, an analytic solution. Uh, it's given here. You might want to compute this at home if, if you want to. So you see, obviously for x2, this is pretty simple. For x1, it's a little bit more involved. Uh, but you can see directly uh, that uh, depending, obviously depending on the product of x1 zero squared times x2 zero squared, if this product is less than one, the uh, trajectory is going to run into an into the, into the origin. And if this product is greater than one, equal to one or greater than one, 
it's going uh, to infinity. So you can see this obviously right here from the denominator, what is going to happen. Uh, it really depends on this initial condition on what is going to happen. So the locals where uh, x1 squared times x2 squared is equal to one, this is obviously a set of hyperbolas, okay? You can see this already here in this figure. So it's a set of these uh, four hyperbolas. So it's two paired hyperbolas. And obviously it turns out that this might also be some kind of separatrix. So there's a region within these hyperbolas where we get stable behavior and there's a region outside where we get unstable behavior. So this is obviously also the separatrix, okay? And uh, the, tra the, the trajectories on the separatrix itself, they're a little bit more simple to compute. Uh, they are unstable because on the one, because x uh, on the separatrix itself, as you can see here, x1 goes to infinity, x2 goes to the origin. So you can already see it here. Uh, x1 grows exponentially, it goes to infinity, x2 decreases, and obviously, of course, it takes a long time for x2 to decrease. Okay, and this is, this gives us our, our state flow diagram, if you want so. Okay, so what happens inside the separatrix? Inside the separatrix, we can see that, of course, obviously, the time derivative of the Lyapunov function is always less than zero because it's every it's always it's less than zero everywhere. However, uh, inside the separatrix, we can see that uh, we have a uh, an in, um, we have a, a radially unbounded set. So inside the separatrix. Uh, the Lyapunov function is growing for both x for both x1 and x2, which means that in this case it also serves uh, as a Lyapunov function if you want so. Okay, so this was some kind of adverse example that should actually warn you. Whenever you probably think that you have found a Lyapunov function, it looks nice. You you should really examine whether it's radially unbounded, and, and, and of course it also depends on the kind of system that you consider whether this is going to work or not going to work. There's one last example before we actually turn to control, and this is the example of mutualism. What does mutualism mean? Uh, there are many systems in nature uh, where you have two different species, two different compartments that somehow interact with each, with each other. Uh, you might want to Google for lotka volterra equations. Uh, just by the way, also the, the current corona crisis and the spread of this disease is also modeled, is frequently modeled by such kind of equations. If you're interested in that, you might, might just Google for that and uh, you, you probably find many different results right now as this crisis is going on, okay? So in this case, it's simple. It's the interaction between two species. And let me just look at, uh, let me just point out uh, the differential equations. Let's assume that uh, the first differential equation describes the growth of the first species. So you can see there's a first part here, which is the so-called exponential growth. You might also have heard this in the media in the last couple of weeks, exponential growth of the virus, the exponential growth of the infection, infections. This is normal for many, many populations, the spread of a disease, uh, the, the growth of a certain populations. So the more individuals there are, the stronger the growth, the more new indivi individuals are generated. There's a second term always also, and this is this actually uh, eventually stops the growth. And this is probably because there's not enough food anymore. Also for the spread of the disease, for example, also the corona dis disease, it's interesting to see if there are not enough individuals anymore where, which could be infected by the virus, then it essentially uh, levels out and comes to a halt, which we can ac actually observe fortunately right now in the media. So this is often expressed, often expressed by this term here. Then there might be a second population. And interestingly, we have these two uh, terms here and they express the so-called mutualism, which means uh, if there is more of the first population and more of the second population, it somehow fosters also the growth of the first and also of the second population. So they somehow uh, live in a kind of symbiosis and uh, you might want to, to read the text that there are some, some uh, illustrations to that, but it's, it's pretty obvious what happens here. It's also good for predator prey models, for example. For example, so if that would be the prey, uh, for example, the, the antelopes, and this would be 
the second one would be the predator then obviously they should go in minus here so if there are more antelopes and more lions then they are, the, the lions would probably eat the antelopes so they are going to decrease and the, the lions feed on them so there are many different uh, equations of this kind and if you're interested just google for the term lotka volterra and you will find many of these uh, equations so it's also good for example for the spread of diseases you might want to, to know whether there is an, a stable equilibrium. So people are now, as you know, everybody's in fear of a second uh, wave of this uh, of the coronavirus and, and scientists actually examine stability and equilibrium points exactly also by means of Japanov stability. So it's really a very uh, concrete and a very actual and very important uh, topic right now also in, 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 in society. So generally there are three equilibrium points. There is uh, obviously one in the origin. So if there are no species is all at all, of course, there's an equilibrium. If there is only one species present, this might also constitute an equilibrium. And if there's a certain inequality which is satisfied, and obviously this refers to the mutualism, then there is a fourth equilibrium. And we are going to make an examination of this. So there are some numerical values here for you, for your ease. And there is a nice figure that shows us our system. So there are our four equilibrium points, one, two, three. And of course, these uh, three, they are not so interesting for us. And there's the fourth one, which is brought about only by the symbiosis, by the mutualism, by the cooperation. So this might also represent some kind of cooperation. This is the shaded area, which is invalid because there's no use in using a negative number of individuals, of course. And we also have some trajectories of the system. So whenever you make such an analysis, it's good to have a computer and then compute some trajectories because it gives you some idea uh, of uh, what is going to happen. And obviously, we, we are going to see that uh, equilibrium four is somewhat stable. It's attractive, if you want. So, so regardless of, uh, almost regardless of where we start from, trajectories are going to end in this uh, uh, equilibrium point number four. So the first thing that we normally do is we make a transformation. So we just shift the coordinates uh, axis into this uh, equilibrium point, which is not very difficult. And then if we do so, uh, it somehow jumps to my eye that uh, such a Lyapunov of function might be useful. So you can see, since all these trajectories more or less go more or less directly into the origin, it might make sense to choose such a Lyapunov function. However, you can see also that there are some regions like this one here. This point is one where this uh, radial Lyapunov function just kisses the trajectory. So you can see if we moved along this trajectory, the Lyapunov function would be decreasing, 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 decreasing. Now it's uh, zero. So in this case, in this situation here, V dot is exactly equal to zero. And now we are actually moving outward. So here, v dot is greater than zero and then we take a turn and we go back so you can see and this is very important to note uh, having a Lyapunov function is a uh, sufficient condition but not a necessary one so you can see also for this trajectory here it satisfies the Lyapunov function satisfies satisfies now there's a violation 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 now it satisfies again and we, we go back to the origin so you can see again, apart from only having the Lyapunov function, this is not enough. We must also determine the, uh, the positively invariant set, which is that set where once the trajectory, I'm sorry, once the trajectories have entered, like this one here, they're never going to leave it again. And uh, obviously you can see that uh, this is some kind of limit trajectory uh, where this is probably critical. So we have to examine it. Maybe there are even other trajectories like this one, it still go out and back in. So we have to examine this. And this is what we're going to do in the next uh, couple of minutes. And uh, in this case, because it's easy, we just establish polar coordinates. Obviously, because this is our Lyapunov function, uh, when we transform it into polar coordinates, it becomes a very easy one. It's simply R squared, okay? And now if we take our differential equation, which is this one here, and if we replace C1 and C2 by the polar coordinates, uh, we get this for the 
time derivative of the Lyapunov function. And again, I would recommend for you at home, try this yourself. So take these uh, state derivatives, uh, replace it by the polar coordinates, and then we get something like this. So this is V dot is equal to something. There is a big, there's a minus, let me find let me find this out. Then there is R squared. This is good because it's always greater than zero. The denominator is greater than zero. And then there is a number of expressions. Uh, let us examine this one here. This is greater than zero. And then there are expressions that actually change as we move along with the, uh, with the uh, angle phi. So you, obviously the cosine might be positive or negative, okay? And then we already see what the problem here is. Depending on the actual value of r, this bracketed expression might be always positive. Or for some values of phi, if, if, r, is simply, uh, if r is simply big enough, it might even become zero. Okay. So obviously, if we take this and set it greater than zero, this is the answer to our question. And um, uh, I solved this for you and uh, just rearranged it. Obviously, we can see that the inverse, uh, the, the inverse of R must be greater than uh, a certain uh, value here, regardless of phi. So just, it should be for all angles of phi. And uh, this is satisfied um, if uh, R is less than this value, okay? So obviously, and this really reflects the situation here, for certain angles, we don't get a problem. Obviously, if, uh, if phi is zero, which is this one here, we probably don't get a problem. If phi is 180 degrees, we are actually in this critical region by where we might encounter some problems. So it's good for you. It might be a good practice for you to, to try this at home. Uh, uh, choose various angles of phi and then just uh, evaluate this expression, expression and uh, make a check for you, okay? So you can see here that uh, if we uh, restrict our positively invariant set to be a circle like this one, then we find out that this circle has a limited radius, okay? But obviously this is not the true solution. So because if we might inflate the, this uh, circle to a certain amount, to a certain radius, which was obviously like 1924, but obviously there are even some other regions like this one, which are outside of the, that circle. And never the, nevertheless, they're outside. All of the trajectories just go to the inside, okay? So this example just reflects the practical problem. Uh, the, actual, uh, the actual region of attraction, the actual uh, positively invariant set might have a very complicated shape and we are not even, even able to express it analytically so it always has to be some certain compromise so for example choosing that circle is a simple mathematical expression we get a maximum radius of, of the circle however we miss out some of these points points which are still stable which are still part of the invariant set so you can see this is always a i would say a, a problem of uh, uh, I would say a trade-off between complicated handling, complicated expressions and getting the, the biggest positively invariant set that you could want to. Okay, so now finally we are going to uh, use uh, Japon functions for control. And uh, let me just point out right from the start that here in, in this section, U is actually boldface. And you remember it from earlier part of the lecture that uh, bold phase lectures in our scriptum denote vectors. So in this case, although the whole lecture is about single variable control, everything that you're going to see here relates to multivariable control, multivariable control systems, where we have a separate lecture on this, uh, uh, which is held by Christoph Hametner. But you can see, you will see here from the equations that everything that we are going to uh, derive here is equally, equally valid for single variable systems and for multivariable systems. It doesn't really play a role. And this is the reason why I chose to just leave this here and you will see that, that this is really not a problem. So first of all, uh, the question is, well, uh, if you consider all the Lyapunov stability theory that, that you've heard today and also last week, it was always about analyzing systems. So we just had this, this uh, funny ecolog ecological system which was a couple, uh, set of two coupled differential equations. And then our task was to analyze 
whether Eastern e stable equilibrium, what is the positively invariant set, which is the region of attractions, and, and so on and so forth. Now, in control Lyapunov function, we go a step further. We would actually like to ask ourselves so if there is a certain Lyapunov function, V of x, so we chose one, then is there any way, once we take the time derivative, to choose our control inputs in, in such a way that the time derivative is always less than zero. So this is what control Lyapunov functions are about, okay? And uh, essentially, if let's assume that we found some control law, which is denoted here by u of x, so we have some state vector and we have some control law. It might be very complicated. It might be uh, discontinuous. It might be anything. The only question is, if our system differential equation is described by this, uh, will we be able to prove that the time derivative of the Lyapunov function is always less than zero. This is also the reason why I wrote infimum here. So which is the, the greatest lower bound. This is really very restrictive, but in principle, this is the actual description of the problem of, of control Lyapunov function. So um, the point is, we might have, this is the, point that makes everything a little bit more complicated. We might have a very nice control law, u of x, and uh, it might even stabilize the system, which is given here, but still our Lyapunov function might not be a suitable one. So the question is, how, we, how, how are we going to find nice Lyapunov functions? So first of all, for this given control law, let's, let's assume that this actually stabilizes the system. First of all, we have to make sure that the Lyapunov function is zero in the origin. It must be radially, in, uh, it must be uh, greater than zero outside the origin, and it must be radially unbounded, okay? And it must be like this regardless of u. So just keep in mind that now u of x might actually have an impact on this, and all those uh, uh, conditions that we are already familiar with must be satisfied regardless of our choice of u of x. So this is very important depending on the system that might not be um, satisfied. And then of course, uh, we might go one step further and take a look at extended Lyapunov functions. And you, rem you might remember that we had this problem with uh, V dot being less than zero or less or equal than zero. And again, an extended control Lyapunov function is such one where all those uh, uh, conditions are still satisfied, but V dot might be zero in some point in the state space, however, not on a trajectory of x of t. You remember this from last week and also from my recap this week. However, just keep in mind that the trajectory of x of t is also determined by our control law. So we might be very unlucky in terms of, we have found a nice, uh, a very nice Lyapunov function, but our control law is such one that uh, there are trajectories of x of, x of t that actually run along the contour lines, the level curves of the Lyapunov function, then it doesn't work. So you see that now it's a little bit more involved because everything also determine, also depends on our particular choice of the, uh, of the control law, okay? So that said, uh, we might have a question, well, is there any control law that we might examine with the Lyapunov function? And here's the answer. If we have such a system, uh, of differential equations and an associated control law that, had, that we have found with an equilibrium point. So we always try to drive the system into the origin where the control is also zero. And if then a control Lyapunov function or an extended control Lyapunov function exists for the system, the control can always be determined such that the equilibrium is globally asymptotically stable. So obviously, if we find any such a Lyapunov function, so this is the good, uh, the good uh, uh, consequence of the consequence of this uh, theorem. Then we are able to find such a control law. So this is the uh, theorem of the existence of such a control law, which is very important. It just tells us, well, if we are able to find such a con uh, such a Lyapunov function that satisfies all these conditions, regardless of the control law, then a globally stabilizing control law exists. Okay, of course, we are all engineers. We want to know what is the control law. And this just tells us, well, a control law exists, which is, it doesn't really help us. It only helps us in the sense that we are able to say, okay, if we just search for it, eventually we can find one, okay? So, 
let's let us uh, take a look at a very simple example and this is a, a linear system let's uh, let's assume that we have a linear system a linear state space system which is this one it's single variable of course and also this is important here and this is also why when when control yaponov functions are good for linear systems we assume that u is limited obviously you already know if there's a linear system you have Ackermann's formula for state feedback controls. So you probably don't need control up on a function to treat the system, these systems. However, if there is a constraint on the input, it might uh, serve as well. So for this uh, simple example, we assume that A is stable and we choose uh, a certain Japono function, a quadratic one. Uh, we call it a candidate because thus far we cannot say whether it's a, a useful one. So we still call it a candidate, okay? So, if we take the time derivative, we get this expression, and we know that this expression has to be less than zero. And for you, it's the first time that you see that the time deriv derivative of the Japono function depends on x, and it also depends on u. So the question is, what do we have to do in order to ensure that this Japono function is always decreasing? So first of all, we have to make sure that this expression here, uh, this matrix is a negative definite one so that regardless of, of x, so wherever we are in the state space, uh, this first expression is less than zero. And then secondly, we have to look at this expression here. And uh, Obviously, if we choose a control law, this is a control law. And it's actually a very primitive one. So you can see this control law set just says u is equal to u max. So it's, um, it's the maximum input value times the sign of this expression. So you, you see that this depends on x. So p transpose times r times x might be positive, might be negative. We take the sign and we multiply it by u max. And then obviously the sign of this uh, expression times the expression itself is simply equal to the x absolute value. And then we get for the time derivative of this Lyapunov function, we get this expression. And uh, since this is less than zero, obviously the overall expression is less than zero and we have a stable control law. So you can see here that uh, even though our control input is limited, so there's a accurate saturation, we can ensure that the system uh, is stable in the sense of Lyapunov. So you must uh, consider that because there's a limit on the actuator, our originally linear system together with the control law might become a nonlinear system. So this is probably very important to note, and maybe it's good to denote this in, in your lecture notes. Nonlinear systems can originate from linear systems if we have constraints in the system. The constraints in the systems in the system have to be reflected by the control law. So this is a nonlinear control law. It reflects or it considers the saturation. So all in all, the closed loop, uh, the closed loop dynamics is actually a, a nonlinear one. There's something else which I would like to say. In this case, we have been very conservative. We have looked at the time derivative of the Lyapunov function and we found that it uh, comprises two terms, this one here and this one here. And then I just said, okay, if we want to make sure, we just, uh, we just require that both expressions are less than zero regardless of each other. And of course, this is very conservative. You might also take a look and just require, maybe let me just remove this here that this is less than zero. And then from this, uh, some kind of control law follows. I just might write that u is less or equal than, say, minus x transposed, transposed r plus r times a x. So this is the first part on the, on the left-hand side. I just put it to the right-hand side. And I divide this by a scalar, which is two times b transpose times r times x. So you see, this is an inequality. If this inequality holds, 
the time derivative of the Lyapunov function is decreasing, and this is the absolute minimum requirement that our control law has to satisfy. Okay. And then you might even want to examine whether this is uh, this is within uh, say u min and u max. So and you can already see why Yapunov functions do make sense if you apply them to uh, to linear systems. If you have this uh, restriction here, which you find here, you might examine like. What is the locus in the state space? So what state vectors uh, can we admit such that this inequality is still within our admissible range of the control input? So for this purpose, it's very important. And then of course, there are many practical systems for, where, for example, if the, if the actuator is saturated, if, the, if u is equal to u max, uh, the system might not be stable in the sense of Yapunov. So for this purpose, it's a good way to examine Yapunov stability. Okay. We might also apply Lyapunov stability theory for another class of systems which we already know. These are the nonlinear input affine systems which are given here, with the only difference to the preceding chapter that we have a multivariable system here. So you might even express this like this is A of X, and then we just write this like a sum of say B I of x times u i and i runs from one to m. So we assume that there are m different inputs, so this is the way we see it. Uh, let us examine what happens uh, if we have some uh, candidates for a, for a control up on the function. We, we assume that we have found one, we, we think that there is a v of x which is useful for our system. And now let's, now let's take a look what, ha what happens if we examine stability. First of all, we already know we have to take the gradient again v dot is equal to the uh, gradient of v transposed times uh, x dot which in our case is a of x plus b of x times u and we just ask well will it be less than zero or not okay so if we do so, obviously we get this, we get this result here. It, lo it looks a little bit strange. Uh, and we could ask the following questions. First of all, we see there's one expression that only stems from the autonomous system. So let's start for the, uh, for the moment with the uh, consideration that u is always zero. If u is always zero, so we, if we don't do anything to the system, if we just let it, leave it alone, then this expression is responsible for stability. So if a transpose times x times vx, uh, the gradient of v, would be less than zero, then the uh, autonomous system uh, by itself would already be stable. The next question would be, well, are we able to influence stability of the system by u at all or not? And this uh, question is answered by looking at this expression. Is this expression different from zero question? Let's assume that we are unlucky. So we chose a Lyapunov function, which looks nice, but this expression here is always zero. If it's always zero, it means that this Lyapunov function and the decay of this Lyapunov function cannot be affected by a control input. We just didn't choose it properly. Or there might be situations where some regions in the state space, not always, but some regions in the state space are such that this is zero. That this is zero. And this means as long we're in this region of the state space, we are not able to affect the decrease of the Lyapunov function. So still the system might be stable, our control law might be stable, but we are not, uh, we are not able to affect this particular Lyapunov function. And this is everything that I've just said right now is, is reflected in theorem 6.6, which is the control Lyapunov function for control affine system. So we consider two different cases. Case one is, which is this one here, that this expression that relates to the uh, control input is different from zero, which means we are able to affect the system. We're able to affect the system for all x so this is very important so it's everywhere in the state space except of course in the origin okay so you see what i just wrote here so v of x 
v, the up on the function, is affected by the control input, then we are lucky because we might choose a certain control law in such a way that v dot is less than zero. If it's not the case, then we have to look at the autonomous system, which is this one. And in this case, uh, we should check whether this part of the system, this expression is less than zero, which means that the system is going into the origin, converging into the origin by itself. So we don't have to, to use any control law, the system is going to converge into the origin by itself. If it's zero, then this should only happen in the origin uh, and not along any trajectories of the system. So this is everything in, in one place. And uh, thus far, I've not talked about any control laws. And normally, we don't, openly speaking, we don't use uh, control Lyapunov function theory to derive control laws. Normally, we, we, as I've just said last week also, we only use it to analyze. We only use it to analyze the ability of systems. However, of course, there's a number of, of control laws that is found in literature. One example is given here, which is called Sontag's control law. So there was some guy, guy which was called Sontag. And he found a control law, which you can find here. So I just give it here in terms of equations, so to say. I have to say, so uh, I've only used it rarely. It's not a very nice control law. It's just here for educational purposes. And uh, let me highlight this. So we assume in this case that x dot is equal to a of x. So this is the uh, autonomous part. And then there is the sum of m different uh, uh, control inputs. And then of course, Sontag's control law reflects the idea that we want the Yapunov function to go into the origin, so to decrease as quickly as possible. So this is the basic idea of uh, Sontag's control law. And let's just take a, examine this a little bit, okay? So, if we look at the uh, time derivative of the Lyapunov function, first of all, this is the autonomous part. We assume that it's less than zero so that the system is stable by itself. So it's, it would be stable if we, even if it didn't take any control action. And then of course we can simply set u to zero and it would be stable if we just left it, leave it alone. However, we could also use any of these control inputs to make the, the Lyapunov function decrease as quickly as possible. And this is what we do here, and this is what is what, uh, what which is actually the idea, the basic idea behind co uh, Sontag's control law. So we take the maximum. So you see, u i is u i max, which is the, the maximum admissible value, times the, again times the sine of this expression here. And then we see that each of these different control inputs, and you see this doesn't matter whether it's just one or m or ten or twenty of them they all contribute in, in driving the Japono uh, function to the origin as quickly as possible. So this is the, the basic idea behind uh, Sontag's control law also. And what you can see, I haven't mentioned this before, such a control law is of course nice in driving the system to the origin quickly. However, in terms of applying it, it's not so nice because you see it's actually a discontinuous control law. It's the sign of something. So this is either zero, this is either, either one or minus one times some value. So this, if you have to apply this, for example, assume you want to control a vehicle. So this is vehicle control. And this is the, the accelerator pedal or the, the, the brake pedal. It would not be very nice to just, to just have full throttle all the, uh, all the time or zero throttle. This would not be very comfortable, right? And it's not good for any kind of actuator, whether it's a valve or whatever, to just have a discontinuous control. So it's, it's just given here for the sake of completeness, but it's not applied very often. And there is, there's a second variant for exactly for this reason, where we uh, take a so-called saturation function. So you, you can see obviously that uh, it probably somehow looks like this. Let me sketch this. So there's some V and then there's some uh, V max. There's some minus V max. And then you see uh, that we simply have some, some kind of the characteristic like this, just in order to avoid this discontinuity. And there are many of, uh, of these control laws around the literature which you can find, okay? 
Let's uh, take a look at one illustration example, which is given here. Uh, it's a nonlinear system, obviously. So we have an autonomous part, which is this one. And then we have a multivariable uh, input. So we have two inputs. Uh, U1 only affects the first differential equation. U2, as you can see here, only affects second differential equation. So first of all, we examine the autonomous part of the system, which is this one. And again, whenever you do this, when, whenever it's possible by any means, I recommend that you just uh, have your computer solve, numerically solve for a number, for a set of trajectories for a bundle, because then obviously you can already guess what the system is going to do. So you can see uh, as, as, as long as, as we are far away from the origin, all the, the, the trajectories just move into the origin and then as we get closer, we are actually getting into some kind of vortex. Okay, so we assume or we suspect that this is a stable attraction point. And again, in order to, again, in order to check this, we are using this, uh, this kind of Yapuna function, which you see here. So we are always using this, this radial Yapuna function in this course, obviously. We have the gradient, which looks outward. And then we, uh, we compute all the necessary uh, ingredients. First of all, uh, we transpose times our input vector P is X1 and X2. So luckily, as long as X is different from zero, P transpose times VX is different from zero, which means our control input can be used to uh, affect the system. If that would not be the case, so if it would be zero, it would mean that regardless of our control input, we might affect our system, but we would not be able to affect the degrees of the Lyapunov function. So that said, this is the time derivative of the Lyapunov function. You can see it here. So this comes from our control, so to say, and this comes from the autonomous part of the system. And now let's take a closer look at this one. Obviously, you can see here that we have x1 squared and x2 squared. So this is uh, greater than zero. And then we have one minus, and then there's some e to the minus x1, x1 squared and e to the minus x2 squared. So uh, for each of these x's, if, the, if they're just uh, big enough, uh, this, will eventually be, uh, this will eventually be less than one. So if only x1 and x2 are just close enough to the origin, we, we can assume that this is uh, going to decrease. Of course, depending on how close we are. And you probably might, might try this at home, find some values of x1 and x2 where this is uh, no longer the case. So just uh, this is some homework probably for you, okay? And again, if you look at the uh, trajectories of the system, you can see as long as we are far away from the origin, uh, obviously, uh, if our Lyapon of the, the level curve of our Lyapon function would be a circle, then we are obviously intercepting that circle and, and moving into the origin. But as we get closer, and if as x1 and x2 get, uh, get smaller and smaller, we might suspect. Uh, that v dot is no longer uh, less than zero, and uh, we want to check this at home. Now, for this for this system to be controlled, we use uh, Sontag's control law, which is uh, which is given here. So now everything is just following the recipe. So this is the control law, and I'll leave this again for you as a homework to check this. And uh, the control law looks a little bit funny. You can see here u of x, so it's a multivariable control law. Keep this, this in mind. So this is uh, two components, u1 and u2. So this is some factor here and some other factor here. So they both depend on x, if you want so, times, uh, times the state uh, vector x itself. So you might also want to know that this is actually one minus e to the minus uh, r squared, okay, so this is the, the distance from the origin, and then this is minus one times to the minus r squared plus one. Okay, so this is a funny control law. And you can see also the state vector, if you consider the state vector, like for example, this one here, 
the state vector is pointing that direction. And then of course, the control law is uh, generally pointing into the opposite direction. So I just use a different color. So you see the, the direction of the control input is determined by x, but the, the actual, the, but the actual uh, attitude is actually determined by this one. So we have this expression here, uh, minus this one, which is uh, generally uh, pointing in the opposite direction. So we have some, some control that it actually helps us to push the system into the origin, and you can, it's actually reflected here. So this is the control system. So already from, from looking at the system trajectories, we can guess that each of these trajectories is going to converge into the origin more quickly than without the control over where we're actually starting uh, to spiral, okay? And it's also like uh, reflected here in this uh, time plot. So you can see the control versus the, the uncontrolled way. And, um, just keep in mind that uh, this is one of the rare occasions where these control laws work. Normally we use Yapunov functions and control Yapunov functions rather to examine an already existing control law and check whether it's going to be stable or not. Okay. So now for the rest of the lecture, and uh, you've probably already noticed that uh, Alexis Benatier has sent you some uh, auxiliary material because this uh, summer term, everything is different uh, because of the coronavirus. Uh, also, I also chose to, to deviate a little bit from our plan and show you something uh, which is probably new to you. It's not found in your lecture notes, but uh, you've received this, this uh, copy of this uh, chapter. Uh, right now it uh, can be seen as an appendix to the, the scriptum if you want to. So the next, uh, next year is probably going to be a regular chapter. We chose it because we found in our research uh, where we do a lot of, uh, I would say, industrial, uh, where we tackle industrial control problem, problems, that uh, feed forward control, dynamic feed forward control, which is the name of this chapter, is very important in your practice as control engineers. This is the reason why we chose to, to bring this to you in this course, okay? Uh, there is this other chapter about backstepping. Uh, it's in your course book, of course. And uh, you might want to look this up somewhere when it, it comes to your mind. It's, it's interesting, it's useful. Uh, we cannot cover everything. And of course, the backstepping will not be part of the exam, obviously. So uh, it's just for you as, uh, as a reference, if you want. So what is feed forward control? Thus far in your, in your history of control courses, uh, let me go to this part here, you have seen control layout, which was like there was a plant, there was a controller, there was probably some disturbance, then there was the output, there was some feedback of the output, uh, then there was a reference value, there was a control error, and there was some control algorithms. You probably also had the, the state feedback control, for example, where we computed the U with the Ackermann formula, but all in all, it was only these two components, the plant, disturbances, the controller, and some feedback. Feed forward control as opposed to this is something completely different and it's often encountered in, in industry that we have some reference W coming from somewhere. Then there is some control algorithm which is feed forward control. It computes some uh, input trajectories of the system and then of course uh, there will be some output. Okay. Very important to notice there is no feedback here. This is the reason why it's called feed forward control. So generally, it does not affect stability. So in all the feedback control that, you, that you've heard so far, we always had to tackle the question of uh, stability. So if there is some state feedback, is it going to be stable, for example? If there is some PI control, you remember uh, frequency methods, is it going to be stable? How about phase reserve, phase margin, all that stuff? This is generally not the, the situation with, with feed forward control. It might affect stability, if it's a very bad design and if we have a nonlinear system, then uh, we might have problems. But generally, there's, there's no problem with, with stability. Uh, and uh, generally, what we see here is that uh, if, if we have disturbances that act on the system, so if there's some D, and if we know about this D, then there might be some way to compensate for it. So for example, 
uh, if you drive your car and you see that uh, the, uh, the road ahead is actually going uphill, then this is something like a known disturbance. You, you know what is going to happen and then you have to depress the accelerator to compensate for it, okay? This would be a typical example of feed forward compensation or maybe even simpler, if you read the weather report, the weather forecast for tomorrow today, it's pretty cold still and windy. Tomorrow it's going to be warm. So somebody go is going to tell you what is going to happen tomorrow. So you're going to adjust your clothing, what you put on tomorrow accordingly. So this is some kind of feed forward. So you're not reading the temperature to of tomorrow. You're just using the forecast uh, and, uh, in order to, to choose your control actions. So for example, okay. So let me go, this is a very general what we're going to cover here is model-based, model-based feed-forward control. What is model-based feed-forward control? It means that there is some kind of model of the system, for example, a state space model. And then we're going to do the following. Somebody tells us the reference. And again, you see this introduction again has bold face letters because it might be single variable or even, or even multivariable. It doesn't matter for, that, for, for this purpose here. In general, somebody tells us uh, where, where we should drive the system. For example, there's a set point change, there's a chemical plant. We have to con control the temperatures, the temperatures uh, and the pressures in some way. So somebody tells us where this all should go. And then there's a model. And then this chapter is going to teach you this. How are we going to, to use that model in order to determine, well, what is the proper input into the system to drive our output to where we want to, which is generally W. And what is the way we are going to get our system from a certain set point to another certain set point. So it's very important to consider that in practice, somebody tells us, for example, if we control a chemical plant, there's a certain pressure, say P0, a temperature T0. So this is where the, the, the reactor, let's assume that there's a chemical reactor, it's currently operating at this point. And then some, somebody tells us, this, so this is W, we should move to P1, maybe a higher pressure and a higher temperature, okay? Somebody tells us to do so. The question is, what is the proper trajectory to go there? So nobody tells us about the trajectory that is feasible, okay? So this is very important to note. And this is what model-based feed-forward control is about. You might think of this as trial and error. So we have some U, we apply to a model, we look at the output, we say, okay, we are satisfied, we are satisfied with it or not, okay? So this is, this is what model-based feed-forward is about. And you could think of it as some kind of inversion of the system. So somebody tells us, where we should go. So we, we, we want some output. And the question is, what is the proper input to get this output? So it's in some sense, it's an inversion, an inversion of the system. And I'm going to return to this term inversion later on in this chapter, okay? So it's very important to note, whenever we do some kind of feed forward control, no matter whether it's a very complicated nonlinear model, or it might be even some kind of pre-filter again, a very simple primitive one, there's always the idea of inverting the system in between. This is very important to note. Okay, now to explain you what I actually mean, I'm going to return to this very simple example that you already remember from an earlier stage. It was uh, probably three weeks ago. And this is this, uh, this cup with this uh, funny parabolic shape. So uh, there is some inflow, which we call U of T. This is our control input. There's a nonlinear uh, cross section that depends on the actual height. And of course, obviously we want to control this. There is some outflow. You probably remember this example. And uh, this is the governing differential equation. It's the same as before. And um, uh, now again, I'm choosing the same funny trick that I've already explained to you in the chapter of feedback linearization. I choose U of T to be like A, A of H. So this is our our nonlinear cross section times h dot, okay, plus uh, a times the square root. So you could even think of it. I just uh, I, I just took the whole equation and solved it for u of t. And now I could interpret this equation in the in the following way. Let's assume that there is a certain h of t, which is here and here. So this is given. So we look at the tank. 
we look at uh, its actual uh, level. We enter it here. And then we could interpret this equation in the following way. If we choose a certain u of t as a reaction, we are going to get a certain h dot, so a, a certain change in the level. However, I might also wish to interpret it in the other way around. If I want a certain h dot, so if I want to, to, to steer the system as, as along a certain trajectory, this equation is going to tell me what is the required u of t, okay? And uh, now for the sequel, we are going to denote a star as the so-called desired trajectory. So we assume that there is a certain desired trajectory, h star of t. So we want this uh, tank level to, to follow a certain trajectory. It might, for example, it might look like this, just to give you an example. It could look like this. It might even, this is may, maybe more practical, look like this. So we want to fill it up in a certain amount of time or we might want to empty it, anything is possible, of course. Very important to note is here that we do not only need h star of t in order to evaluate the equation, it's also important to have h star dot. This is a consequence of this equation. We need both, we do not only need h of t, or we also need h uh, dot, uh, which is this one here. And what we see here is actually the same equation as above, however, with a different interpretation. It actually means there's a certain desired trajectory, there is its derivative, and this equation tells us what is the required input of the system in order to achieve that trajectory, okay? And obviously, we cannot choose any of these trajectories because this bump here is actually limited. There is a minimum inflow, which is definitely zero probably, and also there's a maximum inflow, which means all possible trajectories that we can achieve are actually within these limits here, okay? It looks a little bit clumsy, of course, because we have h and we have h dot both involved, but this equation tells us what is the possible corridor of trajectories that we're able to fulfill. So if you, if you have paid attention thus far, uh, you might have asked yourself, well, well, how could we actually achieve this trajectory? Because this, doesn't not, this does not relate to reality at all. So this is a control law, if you want so, uh, where on the right-hand side, we cannot find at any place in time the actual uh, level h of t. So where, where is h of t going in the system? And this is the point, because this is actually a feed-forward control law, so there's no feedback, but at some point in time, we have to take that control law and we have to synchronize it. We have to synchronize it with the actual system. So if you think about this in a, in a very simple fashion, Let's assume that somebody fills up the tank to a certain level, h of t. So there's a certain amount, uh, there's a certain point in time we call t zero. And at this point, the only thing we have to do is we have to measure the tank level, which would be uh, h at t zero. And then from this point on, we're able to evaluate the con this feed forward control law. So this is very important to note. Feed forward control does not require any feedback. So we don't need it, save for one point in time, which is this one where we have to look at the system and where we have to synchronize, okay? Once we know the tank level at one point in time, which we call t, t zero, so we call this h star of t zero. And from then on, if we design our control, our desired uh, output trajectory, which is this one, we know the time derivative, we are able to evaluate the feed forward control. Okay, so there's one thing that I haven't mentioned thus far. Uh, in the previous examples, uh, in the previous chapters in, in, in our course, we never talked about, well, how are we going to, to steer the system from one point to the other? We always left it to the controller. The, if you remember Ackermann's formula, for example, we had some signal W, and only if, if W was, it, for example, a, a reference step, the feedback controller did all the work for us. In feed forward control, this is different. We actually have to think about well, how are we going to drive the system from one set point to the other. And from this, 
we also know this. And of course, from this, we are able to evaluate the control law. So you can see in this case, this is very closely, closely related to feedback linearization. However, the actual control law is a different one where we do not require any feedback. This is very important. Okay. So this takes me to the, the next uh, idea. This is, this is called two degrees of freedom control. What does two degree of freedom control mean? And this is highlighted by this uh, idea here. Let's assume for the moment that we have, that we have to control uh, this tank here. So we have to control this tank. Somebody told us, well, what is the desired reference trajectory? We want to fill it up or we want to empty it. So we know H star of T, we know H star dot, the time derivative. And theoretically we know what would be our control input to achieve that trajectory. Everything I've just said so far is reflected here in this box here. This is what we call model-based feed-forward control. So somebody told us what to do. There is some trajectory planning. And from this, we actually know both. We know H star. Theoretically, we also know H star dot. And we also know U star. Or in other words, if we look outside of the box, this is the control input. If we only applied it to the system, the output of the system would be exactly equal to Y star. Of course, and unfortunately, in every practical system, there's also some disturbance. But uh, if you put aside the disturbance for the moment, and if you apply exactly this control law in exactly this fashion, you would see that there would be no control error. Okay. So if you take that very nice, this, this funny ball, if you take the model of the ball, and if you compute the U star, and if you also take Y star, or in, in our case, it would be H star as a side product, it would mean if we apply this control law to the system, the output would be exactly equal to our prediction, okay? Which means any controller that you place here would have no work. It would be jobless because E is always equal to zero, okay? Only if there are some disturbances on the system or also if the model of the plant is not equal to this uh, model here, this is also a practical problem. No plant can be modeled exactly. There's one very nice, uh, there's one very nice uh, citation of a very nice control engineer. He said, all models are wrong. but some are useful. This was phrased by uh, Mr. Box. He was a very famous uh, scientist. And uh, this really re reflects, and this, this is very important also for, for us as control engineers. You can model a plant very accurately, but you will never be able to completely, perfectly model it, which means, uh, whatever you do here, there will always be a mismatch between this actual U and the U that would be required to take the output to perfectly follow this Y star. And this is also the reason why we have some feedback control here. So let me turn again to this uh, idea of two degree of freedom control. Where does this name com come from? It comes from the idea that with model-based feed-forward control in the way I've just shown it to you before, we are able to shape the reference tracking behavior of the system. So we design some trajectory, we, we design some uh, required input for that trajectory, <clears throat> and from this we're able to design how the system is going to follow a certain reference, okay? However, if there are some disturbances on the system like this one here, or if there are some mismatch, mismatches between the plant model and the model based with forward control, then there will be some control error, and then there is some feedback control that is required to counteract. And this is the reason why it's called two degree of freedom control. The feedback control is only responsible for disturbance compensation. You might design it very slowly with, small, with uh, slow poles, for example, using the Ackermann formula. And if you want the reference behavior, reference tracking to be very fast, then it sits in here, okay? So both uh, components feed forward uh, reference tracking and disturbance rejections are, re rejection are decoupled from each other. And this is the reason why we call it two degree of freedom control, okay?
And again, you can see it very clearly here from, what, from my explanation. Uh, if the model is accurate, and whatever we do here is some kind of inversion of the system. So we, by doing this, we actually answer the question, if we want a certain output trajectory, if we want the plant to follow this trajectory, what is the required input to do this? And of course, in a, in a <coughs> few minutes, I'm going to show you in, in a more general form how this is done. Okay. So what we did here with this uh, very simple system can be generalized and it's pretty similar to the uh, feedback linearization stuff. We consider, in this case, single input, single output systems, of course, with full relative degree, so you already know what it means. And uh, let's just do as we did with the feedback linearization. Let's start with a system transformation. So we see, we assume that there's a new uh, state vector C, which is obtained by our diffeomorphism. So C1, we assume, is equal to Y of T, which is the output. C2 dot is Y dot, which is, of course, C1 dot. And then we know this is the lead derivative of H along F, as always. And again, we assume that uh, LG, H of X is zero. You already know this game from the preceding uh, chapter. We continue this game all the way until we arrive at Cn, which is the uh, N minus first derivative of uh, Y which is uh, Lf to the n minus one h of x plus this leader derivative along g, which is still equal to zero. And only when we arrive at the nth derivative, we see that uh, the input comes into play. So you already know this. Let's summarize it again. First of all, we have a state transformation, which is this one, which essentially uh, makes our system uh, a chain of integrators almost. And then there is our in input transformations. Do we still have this? Okay. And you're, you already know this from, uh, from the feedback linearization. Now there comes the part where we actually go into feed forward control. How can we use this uh, for feed forward control? Again, we assume, we assume that a reference trajectory Y star is given. Somebody told us how to do this. I'm going to show you in about 10 minutes how to do it. Uh, the question now is, are we actually able to realize such a trajectory with the output or not? If we go back, for example, to this ball here, if somebody told us, let me just choose a different color, that our input trajectory should be, our output trajectory should be like this, then obviously it's not possible, possible because in this case, H dot would go to infinity and then we would not be able to fulfill the control law. So the question whether or not a certain output is uh, realizable directly relates to the relative to the degree of the system and, and how smooth this H of T, H star of T is. Okay, so there's uh, some certain uh, smoothness uh, requirements, which we see here. Um, obviously in the general case, uh, the, the trajectory can be realized if it's at least n minus one times continuously differentiable. And then of course, uh, the highest der derivative, which is given here, might be discontinuous because then we get a discontinuous control law, uh, which might be realized in principle. Now, the important step is right now that we assume that we have this reference trajectory, but we, on we do not only have y star of t, but we also have its derivatives. All its derivatives from one, all the way to n minus one and also to n. So we, we do not only need some y star, but we also need uh, its derivatives. And then of course, if we assume that our system perfectly follows this output trajectory, then we might also be able to, to apply the transformation, which is given here. And uh, from this here, from this control law, we actually are able to, uh, to compute the necessary control input. So what we do here is we assume that our system is already perfectly uh, on this trajectory. I'm going to show you how this works in a minute. And if we assume that the system is on this trajectory, we are able to compute x star. And from this and also from knowing the nth derivative, we are able to compute the necessary control input to stay on this trajectory. Okay. So uh, 
how are we going to do this? And again, as I've mentioned with the uh, with this poll, at some point in time, we have to take this uh, this state vector c star or x star and synchronize it with the real system. And this is down here. So at some point in time, which I call t zero, we actually have to measure the whole state. So this is uh, x uh, of t zero. You might write like that uh, c of t zero is obviously t of x of t zero. So we are able to express this. And this is where we start uh, to synchronize the system. So you see that uh, at some state, we at some point in time, we have to measure the state. And then from this point on, we only have to compute our reference trajectory. Of course, it has to be smooth enough to, to fit this. Okay, this is the only restriction. And from then on, only by knowing the nth derivative, we are able to compute the control input. Okay, so this is the general form of the nonlinear feed forward control. So what we do is, at some point in time, let me summarize this, or let me repeat this, at some point in time, we record the state vector, we have to measure it in some way. Uh, from this point, we are able to, to compute uh, the transformation C. And from this point on, we, we are able to, we have to compute some state trajectories. So we, we have to know where we want to drive the system. We have to know Y star, its derivatives, all the way through its nth derivative. And from this on, we are able we are able to compute the input without any feedback, okay? And this also reflects my idea about uh, how to invert the system. Inversion of a dynamic system would be probably like, could be expressed like as follows. So this is our system sigma, okay? So it's expressed by our um, differential equation. Now invert, if we have the, the system by itself, uh, we could answer the following question. If there's a certain uh, u of t, then of course, what is our y of t going to be? We are going, we would be able to solve it, for example, using uh, numerical techniques, solving the differential equation. That would be sigma. And sigma to the minus one, the inverse of the system would be like, there's a certain output which we would like to have. What is the required input? And as we've just seen before, this answer, this, this question cannot be answered all the time. So if there, is a, if there is a desired output that cannot be fulfilled, there will be no answer to, the, to this question. So in terms of block diagrams, it would be like the following. Uh, we would have to pass some, to someone our desired trajectory. So Y star, it's derivatives. So all these derivatives have to be, uh, have to be continuous uh, with exception of the last one. And then taking this, uh, we are able to compute uh, an input to the system such that the output is exactly equivalent. So you can see this is not an equal sign, but this is equivalent. The output Y is exactly equivalent to this Y star. So it's an inversion of the system if you want so. Okay. So this is how our feed forward control is done. Let me specialize this for, for linear systems, which is probably pretty easy. Everything becomes very, very simple. So in linear systems, our representation looks like this. You already know this. And then the full relative degree. So everything that we did for the nonlinear system, obviously it can also be done for the linear system. For this to hold, for the full relative degree, all those expressions, which are the lead derivatives, they have to be zero for I zero one all the way to N minus two. It has to be different though for the uh, n minus one, as you can see here. Then our state transformation is actually pretty easy. It's like this. You can see that the state transformation, the transformation matrix is simply equal to the observability matrix. which you already know from, from early on in this lecture. So this is the observability matrix. And this is our simple feed forward control law. So you can see you have to know X. And if you know X, and if you know the desired nth derivative of the output, you're able to compute the control input. So it's summarized here again. So we have to capture the state at one point in time. 
And this is from where on we synchronize with the system. So this is our where we start with the X star. X star is then uh, transformed to the Y star. And then we have to find some trajectory, obviously, in order to track the system. This is how it is done. Now, before I start with a very nice uh, example, I've always, uh, I've always talked about trajectory planning. So how could we design a trajectory? There are different ways and approaches into that. I'm just showing you in this lecture here, a very uh, simple one. And this is by polynomials. And this is uh, especially feasible, for example, if you have a chemical plant. The normal situation is like this. Uh, in the beginning, like when T is zero, we are in some operating point. Let's assume that this is a temperature or pressure. And we want to move the system to a new operating point. And it, it might take us T time units, for example, seconds. Okay. And then, of course, we, we, want, uh, we want all these to happen smoothly, which is we want uh, the uh, beginning of this trajectory to be very smooth. So you see all those derivatives up until the nth order zero. And also we want to end up in the, in the terminal operating point also very smoothly. So you can see I'm just moving to this figure. So you can see those trajectories, they're really very nice and very smooth. So then in order to do this, there is a recipe for you how to do it. So you can see that uh, uh, the reference trajectory is y0, zero, y zero, zero obviously, plus y by time plus the, the difference between the terminal value and the, uh, and the initial value times those polynomial coefficients. So you can see this is nice in two different ways. First of all, it's smooth. Secondly, it's simple. And thirdly, as, I've, as you've seen here, you also need the time derivatives and they can be determined easily from this by just taking the time derivatives. And I've just given you some examples for a certain system orders. There are these uh, polynomial coefficient so it's not really really difficult and it's always uh, a matter of, of practice and also what is nice uh, the, uh, the actual time that it takes for the for the transit is given here so this is uh, this polynomial is always expressed relative uh, in relative time coordinates so this is very nice because if you have such a transit let's just go back to this uh, bowl if you design a certain trajectory, such a transit, and if you determine, if you find out it's too fast, so if this, this transit is very fast, you will probably need a very strong pump and a lot of volumetric flow to realize it. And it's probably, it's probably too much, so you're going to violate these constraints. And then, of course, you determine or you find out that the transit has to be slower. And in order to do this, you don't have to recompute the whole polynomial you only have to change this one value here. So this is the second nice feature of this. So you can see this polynomial is always uh, expressed in relative time coordinates, as you can see here, okay? This is one way. There are definitely other ways as well that would also serve the purpose, and it's just a matter of, of, uh, of finding it out. So I'm going to show you, and I'm not going to finish it today, uh, an example, which is a new lab experiment of ours, and it's, a, it's called the flexible link. We, we bought this because it's a system which is encountered in very different industries, for example, car suspension, everything that vibrates, and where there's some, some robot arm, for example, that might be used to, to suppress this vibration. Let me just show you this video. This is how this system works. So you see there's a servo unit in the base, uh, there's an electric motor that is used to drive the system. Then we have this rectangular box, and there is this this arm which is suspended by two springs. And obviously, this is a vibrating system. There are strong couplings you can see. And you might think of of different systems in industry where you have these oscillations, like cars, for example, so wherever things uh, vibrate you wouldn't like to, to encounter this. So before I'm actually, and I'm probably on, only going to finish this example next, uh, next week, I'm going to show you uh, what happens if we only apply uh, feed forward control. So the, the uh, example that, that I'm going to show you right now is the system without any feedback control. So you have just seen how it vibrates without any control. And this is what happens if you only apply feed forward control. 
And uh, as I've said before, feed uh, to degree of freedom control is such control where you also apply a controller in the feedback loop. Here, you see this works very nicely. Let me just compare like this is the first example without any control. Okay. So you can see with this without control, there is a little overshoot, little overswing at the end. Obviously, because there is some friction in the system, which we didn't model, and even uh, even though we didn't model this, the the uh, the feed forward control is already very accurate. I actually demonstrated such a system to to some people in industry, and they didn't believe that this is possible without any feedback. So uh, they really wanted me to unplug the sensor cable to prove that this was actually without any feedback control. And before we actually go into the math. Let me show you a slow motion. This is very impressive because it shows you what the controller actually does. So this is slow motion. So you see the, the, the server unit actually takes this black little box and there is some lead, in the beginning there is some lead angle. Let me show you again. There is some lead angle to accelerate the rod and then we have to move into the back in the opposite direction in order to, to stop it down again. And this is uh, what we're going to do with the uh, feed forward control. I'm only going to start it very briefly today and I'm going to finish it the next week. Obviously the system comprises of several parts. There's the arm, which is this one here. There are the springs. There's this box, which we call the base. Obviously it has some inertia. And then there's the servo unit where we are going to drive the system, okay? And this is the, uh, the system sketch. There are two different angles, phi. This is the actual inertial angle of this uh, base here. And then alpha is the, the angle which is relative, uh, the, uh, the angle of the arm relative to the base, as you can see here. And obviously we are going to control the sum of these two angles because we want this, this uh, rod, this arm to move uh, for example, like 90 degrees. So we want to control the sum of these two angles. And uh, as a first, as a starting point, we have to derive the uh, equations of uh, motion. And I'm, I'm going to leave it to you mostly and for a particular reason, because we are going to use Lagrange equations. You probably remember these from your, from your mechanics lessons, the Lagrange equations. You have to set up the, the kinetic energy and the uh, potential energy. And from this, we are going to uh, derive Lagrange equations. I'm going to do it uh, next week, though. And then I'm going to show you how the, uh, the control law is actually derived from this. Good. Done the base. It's uh, already a uh, quarter to two. So uh, I'm actually done with the uh, lecture, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions if there are. Um, yes, I have question do you hear me yes yeah um what about the exam is it on monday next week like scheduled or not no no i think alexis Benatier has already announced this we cannot hold like uh exams right now so we have to postpone it okay okay did you receive any information from him um i didn't look it uh, in detail but um yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. so alexis are you also on yeah, I already sent them a mail, and it's also on the forum on TUVL. Can you say again, please? Uh, I've already sent a mail to the students saying that the, this first exam is cancelled, and I also saved it on Tuesday in the Discord session. All right, good. Okay. There should also be some note on, on, the, on the lab class. Uh, uh, actually, some of us are already admitted to the university, so we will try to... We will check whether we are going to manage to have some automatic lab experiment. And if you're able to do so, you will also be able to, to hold the lab. You will also be able to, to attend the lab class, so to say. And unfortunately, we, are, we don't know yet whether or when we can have a, uh, an exam. Because right now, they are just trying to organize all the compulsory lectures. Okay, So right now... Uh, there are also serious restrictions as to how many people, how many students uh, are admitted to the, uh, to the lecture halls. 
So it probably it's probably going to take some time for for the exams uh, to be possible for us because this is a master class. Uh, so we still have to uh, to keep you waiting, unfortunately. But as soon as we have any news, of course, we will be we are going to post them to you uh, immediately. I have a question uh, to. Yeah. Um, are you thinking of doing two tests or only one? Uh, right now, right now, uh, as we see it, we are probably only going to take one test because it's very difficult to actually get the the uh, the, uh, the seminar rooms and lecture rooms uh, for the test. So we're go only going to take one test. This is the the likely the likely outcome of this situation. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions from your side? Okay, if this is not the case, then uh, thanks again for your attention. And then obviously next week we are going to have the, the, the last lecture. And then uh, we also have the organization. Hopefully we are able to, to uh, hold the lab class. If this is not the case, if it's not possible for any reason, then probably we are going to find some way at least to record some videos or make some tutorials for you, okay? So we have to be flexible in that way and uh, we will find some way to do it. Okay, so thanks again. There are some chat messages. Is this, there was some question, I just read it. Is this how autonomous driving is controlled? Yeah, I just can cannot relate it to to lecture feed forward. Okay, it's a good question. Well, um, autonomous driving is actually a lot more. In autonomous driving, there has to be someone who actually uh, computes the reference trajectory. This is what we would call autonomy. But of course, uh, automated driving, driving assi driver assistance systems, even like autopilots and aircraft. They are mostly all controlled like that, even like chemical plants. And of course, there's someone who actually computes the Y star, so the, 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 the reference trajectory, okay? Any, any more, any further questions from your side? Thank you. Okay. Good, so then thanks again for your attention. I'm going to see you back next week. Thank you, bye-bye.